Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Pasco School Board of Directors this afternoon for our regularly scheduled board study session. The first topic we're going to talk about this afternoon will be the board's legislative priorities. After that, we'll talk about a bond, uh, have a bond update project, and then timeline and public information. And we'll also talk about uh, land at that time. Um, as I reminded you at uh, previous study sessions, all of the board's study sessions are open public meetings. We do have them uh, broadcast on TV, and they're also available if you go to YouTube and look up Pasco Schools. You're able to watch all of our open public meetings. And with that, I'd introduce Ms. Sarah Thornton to start off our uh, board legislative priorities discussion. Thank you, uh, Board President Lehrman. Um, with us today, I'd like to welcome our legislative advocate, uh, Marie Sullivan. Uh, and I'm actually going to turn the conversation over to Marie uh, to discuss the uh, 2018 legislative priorities with you. Thank you, Sarah. So um, thank you. I understand that you have a pretty packed work session. And we have 30 minutes, so we'll try to do things quickly, at least get things started. Um, wanted to say that, as you know, the legislature, 2017 legislature, went into overtime three times, kind of like the Cougs last weekend. Um, unfortunately, they're, they weren't as quite as successful, and the fact that um, ending it on July 20th was, was really a long 193 days of special sessions and regular session, but they ended without a capital budget, as you know, and there still has not been movement on a capital budget. Uh, in speaking with Representative Theringer last week, and he's the chair of the House Capital Budget, he said we might see something in October, if not in October, maybe November, or it may be January. So they just really don't know. There is um, the, the legislature still has the link between uh, the capital budget, which is a $4.3 billion budget, and a policy bill around water rights and exempt permit wells, permit exempt wells. So there has been, there have been some conversations this interim uh, about trying to resolve what's called the Hearst case, but uh, to this point, still no action has been, um, has been resolved. There are some, and I would say school districts are part of that, that are really trying to um, encourage legislators to de-link the capital budget from a policy bill. This is unprecedented, never happened before. And, um, but there isn't a lot of interest yet in doing that. So I think there will have to continue to be public pressure uh, to see if we can actually um, get that budget gone. Uh, the good news for us is that we do have one point, uh, one point mil we have a million dollars in there and we have got our 30,000 in there to support the Department of Commerce. So unlike in the past where they might take a 5% admin fee out of the top, we actually have a full million dollars for the Pasco Early Learning Center. And that's in the compromise budget. So when they pass the capital budget, we know we will get the million dollars. Um, and I've talked to Senator Walsh just to confirm that there is absolutely no way that can come out. And so I think you should feel at least solid that once they finally do come into session and pass the capital budget, that that money will be there for PASCO. So, um, so that's exciting and I'd like to say congratulations and thank you for you and all your, uh, your good work. Um, you have in your packet uh, a list of, in the last two pages, what we had adopted in 2017, and then uh, priorities, and then also some guiding positions. And in that, uh, it also talks about uh, a little bit about where the accomplishments were, just so you know kind of where we are. So to expedite, I think I'm not going to go through that right now, but I'll leave it for your reading. Um, in looking at 2018, uh, this is our first conversation to say, do we, can we agree on a few priorities? Understanding that session will start January 8th. It's a 60-day session, and my guess is, based on the 2017 session and special sessions, there is not going to be a lot of interest in going beyond their 60 days. So 
my guess is that they will be using 2018 to do fixes, tweaks, um, and, and basic little policy adjustments and that they probably will not be interested in taking on really big policies or really big changes. Um, the exception to that, though, is uh, House Bill 2242 was the McCleary education funding proposal. And that's what your staff is working through now to uh, make sure that 2017-18 school year is in alignment and then when things really start to kick in for 2018-19 and beyond um, that we're finding fixes and so what we have heard from many of the legislators who were part of the negotiating team is that they realized that did get slammed together at the very end fairly quickly. None of us saw it. I, I mean, it basically came out on June 29th. They ran the bill on June 30th. And so they're, they are open to making some fixes. And I think that's where we may want to spend some attention on priorities as looking at things that in particular aren't going to work for the Pasco School District and things that we want to talk to legislators on early and then often and try to get either uh, some coalitions built with other school districts, um, with some of the state associations, and make sure that, um, that those voices are, are out there. There may be some fairly unique things to, to districts like Pasco, and that's um, where we'll look for that. Uh, so priorities, looking at, um, I just gave you two possible priorities for the 2018 session. One is a um, repeat from last year, and this is the focus on K-3 grant money. In the 2017-19 capital budget, there was no K-3 grant money. So as you might remember, that was a, a pot of money. It was $200 million in the 15-17 capital budget. The idea was they would be uh, three rounds at $200 million apiece, and that that would help school districts. They would be grant dollars. So you wouldn't have to pass a bond, but you would be able to use them to get to the K-3 smaller class size. Uh, the legislature did one round. They didn't have any plans in the 1719 capital budget to do that. One of the reasons is because the school construction assistance program, so the SCAP program, was over a billion dollars. And so they looked at that and said, first time we've ever had that large of investment for school construction, for renovation, we don't have any additional money for K-3. But, um, the, you know, we have to pretend that they've passed the capital budget and say, all right, if they're coming back in for a tweak, is it reasonable to be pushing them to do uh, a second round of the K-3 grants. So that's one option of, of consideration. And then a second would be, again, looking at what some of the fixes might be that staff identify or that you identify as being really problematic for PASCO related to this new McCleary education funding formula. So let me stop there for just a second and answer questions. And President Lehrman, I'm not sure how you'd like yeah. to proceed. Go ahead, open, open conversation here. Questions, comments from the board on either these two topics here on, the, on our front page or uh, additional priorities. So I know one of the things that's come up in our WASDA Ledge Committee meeting is the potential for, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, but those school districts who were allocated money for the super scap and have not used it by a certain period of time, redirecting that money to those who have applied and mm -hmm. made the cut but didn't get money. So I think that is certainly something we could add to this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that was something that we talked about last year. I did talk to legislators about that um, and was told it'll prob it, they, they wouldn't want to do more than um, two reappropriations. So that would be a whole, that would be six years worth of being able to have access to that money. This year is going to be a little odd, again, because the reappropriation, if you are a school district that got money in the 1517, you actually did get a reappropriation. So the legislature passed a 
reappropriation only capital budget. So no new money, but reappropriation. So districts that got money in that first round should be taking advantage of it. And that is something we can um, ask for and, and maybe even see if we can get legislative language in there. I, I, I'm pretty sure was it tracking this. Somebody's got to be tracking who's spent their money and who has plans to. I have a the list. Conditions of getting the money. <laughs> I have a so list. You were ready to go. <laughs> yeah. So. And there were very few that used. I think um, I I hate to be quoted, but there were about only about six of the districts that received money in that first round that had used. Um, money, that it accessed their money. Um, and one of them had used it all, almost. Uh, but for the majority, they had not touched their money yet. So basically one that had the needs that Pasco had, because I anticipate that we would have already used a good portion of that money. Anyway. Yeah, it's very, it is that frustrating. Really I do have, out. <laughs> I do have the list and I can certainly get that to staff because I did talk to the OSPI school construction folks to find out who would use their money before I went to talk to legislators and said, uh, I think we need to be moving these districts along so that we can get some access. Yes. Yeah, I think considering the, the number of school districts that felt the same way as PASCO, you know, we weren't alone in our frustration with the allocation of that money. It seems reasonable to try to pool our, um, you know, social capital together and, and push for that again because we wouldn't be alone in that. There's many other districts that felt the same way, so it seems like a good, something that we could approach uh, in a coalition of sorts with many, many other districts that would be seeking uh, a similar request of another round of that funding. Are there, is there words, legislative words in there that would protect, I know we've talked about it, and I don't know if it was just verbals that, that we'd gotten from some of the legislators, but that would protect our position, even though we didn't believe that it was a, a good calculation the first time we were close there. If, I won't say if, when we pass a bond, it may be likely that we would no longer qualify do, do you know, are there words in there to protect us or should we be pushing for some words to protect us there? So in the reappropriations bill, there are no words that um, protect because it was basically the districts that got the money. In the 1719 capital budget, it's silent. So one of the things, um, uh, which is, is good in some ways because in a previous iteration, it included uh, the portables, it had it had different pieces in there that would have actually gone against PASCO. Okay. So our arguing was to just keep it neat at this point and then go in and reframe. Um, one of the things they didn't do, for instance, is look at bilingual classrooms. It's something we raised for them in the 2015 session and now they say, oh yes, we should have done more about bilingual classrooms. So I think it needs to be more comprehensive. Um, so we so. don't necessarily want to protect our position, but we need to push so that the calculation uses portables and, and is, is more favorable for our situation. I, and I think it could also re try to retain the position that we are. Um, Either at, one but, of those, whatever. But we might want to, yeah, we might I mean, want pick to boost one up too, so. What's that? We may want to uh, boost our position. Yeah, but I think we need to do one of those two, either get words in to protect our current mm -hmm. position or if if that's not possible, then get words in to make the calculation more fair. Mm -hmm. On the second piece here, which was identifying two to three of the biggest pieces to fix, I know staff have identified a couple of things, one of which I don't know if there's been a conversation yet about them, but for instance, so much like there's the super scap, there's the super lap, right? So there's the, there, and that's the lap boost. Uh, so there's the general lap was increased, but then they also did a 
building by building, if you had a building that was at 50% or more free and reduced price lunch, you also got an additional boost. It was an additional hour and, and things. So the challenge that that brings is if you have a school, an elementary school that's at 49% and an elementary school that's at 51%, you have one school that's going to get the boost and the other one that's not. So uh, in talking to staff, that's identified as an inequity. Um, and it's something we may want to look at. I've raised it with other school districts and I've heard that Tacoma has the same kind of issue. Other districts that are larger that have multiple elementary schools and have some that are at more high poverty, some that are less, are in the same kind of boat. So um, that may be a place where we want to push a per pupil. Um, rather than try to draw the line in the uh, sand. But it's going to come, my guess is that will come down to money, but it's something, again, if we're trying to make sure that we're closing the opportunity gap and we're trying to make sure the money actually gets to the kids that need it most, um, you know, having full, whole schools not have access seems like a problem. So, um, but there, there may be other things that come up. So I think with this one, um, the idea is that we would have this work session today, talk about a few ideas, and then bring something back for October for you to vote on. Um, so the, the thought here is to gather and then hear from staff too. There may be a couple of things then where we could actually put some meat on specific targets that we want to do. I just know that the lap money was one piece. The salary regionalization is another. Um, you know, Richland comes off higher than Kennewick and Pasco. Um, that becomes a problem. And is it fair? Because you probably, you may have teachers living, uh, you know, in Richland who work in Pasco and, and vice versa. So th that may need another look too to see is it as equitable, is it as fair as it can be. Um, so, um, yeah, I have a major, I have a major concern with basing this on building because I think that encourages movement of students. Uh, if you have one or two schools that are very close and one school that is uh, very well past the 50 percent, uh, there would be a perception that some districts may move students to another building to qualify the whole building, and so I, I view that as a major concern. Is uh, with that being if a law or a rule where that could be abused uh, to the detriment of students, although you would qualify for more, uh, more, of, these fund, more of these funds, but uh, through the movement of students, which may not be in the student's best interest. Well, quite frankly, it's, it's simply inequitable. You can't give LAP funds to one school that has 98% po poverty levels and not to another that has 50% and say that you know, those kids are, are more needy. It absolutely should be a per pupil. That's the only fair way to do it. If we're giving kids that are high poverty um, extra hours to help them make up for the fact that, that their education levels tend to be less, we have to address children in, in that situation regardless of what school they're in and, and it should be equitable. So I think that's a great one. And, um, and I think the only fair way to do it is a per, per pupil allotment. I believe the last time that Mr. Bowles and I talked about this, it would, hi, what? under the current rules, there's about 1,300 kids, Eric, that yeah. would go without LAP funding based on the current rules. So that's 1,300 PASCO students who are not benefiting from the additional funding that they really should, should be accessing based on the way that the rules are applied. And, and I would add, if I may, that Real start, excuse me. I think the real start contrast was looking at Franklin, which is just north of 50%, and McClintock, which is just barely under. Uh, Maya Angelo, incidentally, falls into the same category. But Franklin Elementary, I believe, qualified for nearly $180,000 in revenue, and McClintock didn't uh, qualify for any revenue. Uh, I'm talking the additional augmented high poverty lap revenue. So that really is the issue, and I agree with Mrs. Phillips. The Cleanest way to look at it would be a kid of need as a kid of need, not necessarily asking for more revenue, but just the ability to allocate that revenue to follow where the where the kids are in the need. So, just out of curiosity, is it <clears throat> the money is just for the kids who qualify? If if 50% qualify, 
there's additional money just for those 50% or is it the whole building now gets kind of like the free and reduced lunch? So they utilize the threshold for how you allocate the money. Once you allocate the money, there's a fairly prescriptive menu of things that you can do that can impact anybody who's uh, struggling with achievement issues. So it's the, the socioeconomic threshold for the revenue and then other series of regulations in terms of how that revenue is actually expended once it hits the building. Which, which what, with McClintock and Franklin, with two schools that are in almost exactly the same neighborhood and there's a major inequity between those, the education and those two students with that $180,000, yeah, it's just not right. No, and for school systems, $180,000 is a fair amount of revenue. Yeah. Oh. I think most people would assume that it would be different, the opposite for that, from McClintock and Franklin. As people have told me, well, Franklin seems to be in a nicer, the houses are more expensive, you'd assume the family income is greater. So I think that would be shocking to a lot of people. Is that due to the opt-ins, or what, what makes that, that difference? Because if you look at McClintock's boundaries, the average um, household um, uh, is, is less, or the, the cost of, of housing, however you want to word it, than Franklin's. And I, I didn't do that allocation. I didn't do that analysis because they make the they make, the cut was basically made utilizing uh, May uh, free and reduced numbers. Uh, one of the other interesting provisions is for a for a school like Franklin that sits straddles right on that line. If for next year Franklin would dip to say for example 49 percent eligible, they would not receive that revenue in a successive year. So it makes it very difficult to plan for long term meaningful interventions when you have schools like McClintock and Franklin, Maya Angelou, and, uh, Ruth Livingston, and uh, Markham that really kind of straddle that line. Um, and I know it's an issue for, for our, uh, at least one of our neighboring districts having some conversation when I started to look at the numbers. Yeah, that, that's a major issue, Marie. That, this, that, that's, that's not, that's horrible. That, that type of law, that, that encourages us to, to move some opt-ins or move some kids to that school to qualify that school. And if that is our current law, that, that is horrible and needs to be changed. Well, and I, and I think, not, not making a political statement here because it's not really one side of the aisle or the other, but when, when the legislature does its business uh, in closed doors and you're at the third session and you're not relying on school experts to provide you know, some feedback, it's a great boost in terms of revenue. Uh, it just wasn't very well thought out in terms of how it's dispersed. Considering how the K-3 allocation went, we, it sounds like we need some help in the legislature with how they figure out some of these educational well, exactly. and, and like Ms. Sullivan points out, they, you know, the legislature in a typical session would rely on the testimony of educational experts and would rely on people who are working with those revenue streams to really kind of vet their processes and that just, you know, when you go some three this, sessions over, it doesn't happen. Some of this has to go back to SPI though. I mean, those guys set yeah. the rules. It's not just the legislature. The, the legislature puts together the framework, but they did the uh, Well, and in this instance, not being an OSPI apologist by any stretch, but um, <laughs> But, it, but in this instance, OSPI was, hand, was handed this big chunk of revenue about the same time school districts got it. So they were behind the eight ball in, yeah. they, they weren't in, involved in being able to write those uh, regulations sort of concurrent. So they were really kind of in the same boat school districts were this time around, at least in this instance. And I, and I guess what I would say is this is actually in statute. So it, it is one of those pieces that legislatively, I think we could go after. There are going to be, you're right, some things that OSPI decides by their rules and they interpret things. And those are things that we also could look at if there are things staff are finding in the way that they're writing guidance or the way that they're developing, you know, allocations, then we should, well, the way that they decided to interpret that, exactly, which, you know, was kind of like a 180 after uh, staff and I went and met with them and we thought we had one, uh, we thought we understood exactly how they were going to administer it. So, so I, I think certainly this is one that I'm not sure I know enough to make any informed um, decision, but if you guys get information, and I, I'm confident that as the rules and regulations of the new funding model start to roll out, there's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of concerns, and I think, and it's not just going to be us. I mean, I've, I'm reading articles now of school districts saying they're going to be short millions of dollars, um, and I don't. I don't know enough to know how or why that is, but I'm sure there's going to be other things that come through that uh, we probably need to 
address as they come. So I think it might be difficult for us to, to set things here at least specific. Certainly the, the salary regionalization with uh, Richland being different than the other school districts in the area is, is a cause for concern and that would be one that I would put fairly high on the list. If I may just ask Eric to speak to the gap in lap funds for 10th graders too before you into the microphone, it might be interesting to the board. Yeah, so uh, they, OSPI published relatively quickly on, on the lap side, I think about 26 pages of guidance. And as we went through, as we went through that guidance, we're able to do some things around uh, eight to nine transition, which is really right in the bullseye of uh, what we need to do to help kids you know, make that successful transition to high school and, and, and graduate. Uh, we're also able to do some things in uh, kids who are in, in credit deficient in 11th and 12th grade, uh, right during the school day. We're considerably more constrained because it basically just reverts us back to the regular LAP statute in terms of the support we can provide 10th graders with a high poverty LAP, which really constrains us to extended day and extended year opportunities. The issue that we, have, we face there in high schools is oftentimes kids who aren't being successful in high school are not necessarily interested in engaging in the regular school day, let alone in extended day or extended year opportunities. So looking for some relief and some flexibility around how we would be able to utilize those funds at our high schools would, would be a boon, I think, to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. So knowing you've just got a couple of minutes, just um, if I may. So on the second page of your packet, uh, what I did is I looked at um, the things that we had as our guiding positions last year and things that we were able to tick off, like school siting outside of the urban growth area. We did get that legislation passed. It is was signed into law, yay. And uh, now we just need somebody to put it to the test, right? Um, the assessments was a position last year that we had to make assessments more fair, to look at delinking if we could. And there's, uh, you know that there's this expedited appeals process. There's some things that went on with assessments that we think are improved. So I removed those. So what's left on this are six items that I think still remain true and high. Uh, and there may be other things that you as a board want to consider. Um, board Member Christensen, you might be hearing things from WASDA, for instance, that you'd like to have added to this list. So this is just a starting, a starting place. And if there are things then that you would like to talk about, add later, we can talk about that for um, adoption. The guiding principles really don't um, have to be done until the start of session. It's, it's nice for me to use them because I, I use these as a filter, right? So when legislation comes up, we look and say, do we have a guiding position on that? Yes or no, if we do, we, we know what, what I can take, it, um, what kind of action I can take. So these aren't as critical as, as us trying to decide on our priorities and if we can do priorities by October, positions by you know December, that would be great. I think I'd, I'd like to see one drafted up, not that it, I don't know if it will make the final list. We can talk about it again later, but I've heard the board, multiple board members, and we've been talking about this for several years. I've also heard staff say it, but um, adequate funding for social workers and counselors in the school. So if we could put some words mm -hmm. together um, for that, and we can talk about it next time also. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. This is really good. I appreciate the, I would really love to see us, just to reaffirm this, take a, um, a leadership role in this this lap. You know, that that it's not just representative. It may seem like it's just education, but that may help some people realize that not, that don't think about the consequences of some of these laws, like just take welfare. I mean, the way that they organize Medicaid and food stamps has a, just like a cutoff is horrible because it disincentivizes people from actually in, improving their situation. So this may be something that we can, even though it's from an education realm, it can really help maybe in other areas to help uh, people realize that what seems like a reasonable idea may have repercussions that they don't think about and right. maybe we can help change some of those other areas and just have a much better state functioning, uh, much better government in our state. Thank you. 
So if I may just interject one more suggestion from the audience. Uh, Ms. Sarah Thornton um, has a suggestion which really dovetails nicely with the point that you're making about how there's often or sometimes seems to be conflicting um, guidance within the same sets of statute. And our discipline statutes are an example of that. So part of the statute really deals with um, and, and requires districts to focus on reducing the amount of time that students are excluded from the educational environment as a way to um, increase or decrease the achievement gap and provide education for all students. There's other parts of the statute that are in direct um, conflict with that that would allow a student under certain circumstances, for example, to be excluded from classroom instruction for two days. Um, so internal to the organization right now, we're grappling with what is um, mutually exclusive language. You can't do one and also do the other. So um, the inconsistency in student disciplinary statute is something that we're currently grappling with and might be a nice um, priority for us or a, a position. Thank you, Ms. Lauren. All right. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We appreciate it and we'll, look, we'll, ha we'll discuss this again in October. We'll talk about it uh, if we want to schedule it for the first or second board meeting. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Ms. Thornton again to talk about the bond update, well, project timeline, and public information. All right. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to do this from up here since uh, since I've got the the PowerPoint and PowerPoint and a microphone. So watch out. Right. Um, tonight, I am going to talk with you about uh, what we have happening related to our 2017 bond. Uh, as you all know, there is a lot of planning that occurs at the district level prior to the bond election to ensure that as soon as uh, the voters approve the bond in November, we will be ready to move forward as quickly as we can uh, with the projects that are on the bond. So I'm going to talk with you a bit about those project timelines and also about uh, where we are with the information that we're providing to the public um, with regards to the bond and hopefully we can answer um, any questions that you have. I know Mr. Edinger is here um, as well as Mr. Nunnemaker uh, and Mr. Marsh um, and also Mr. Roberts. We've got everybody. So uh, if, uh, if I can't answer it, I'm sure one of them can. Okay. So we'll start with the project planning and timelines related to the bond. These are the estimated, estimated project timelines uh, for the bond projects. Uh, elementary 16 uh, would be scheduled for, for completion in August of 2019. Uh, elementary 17 would follow the year after. Uh, the replacement building for Stevens Middle School then would be scheduled to be completed in winter of 2021. Uh, but the actual demolition of Stevens and the improvements, then the full improvements to the site uh, would occur after that. So the total completion of that project would be scheduled for summer of 2021, um, but the replacement building itself would be scheduled uh, in to be completed in the winter. Um, we also have uh, middle school number four on the bond, and that would also be targeted for a summer 2021 completion. The transportation and maintenance projects and then the school site uh, safety and health projects uh, would have a target completion date of winter uh, 2022. Um, some of the school site safety and health projects will likely be ongoing throughout uh, the duration of the bond, but some of that of course would depend on the uh, the the budget, um, the the final budget that we have to deal with. We we are asking the voters to approve a $99.5 million bond. Um, our total budget then would be driven by our actual um, state match qualification. Um, and then after that, it would depend on how the bids come in for, for the projects. So, so there are a lot of variables that go into the project budgets that also drive that timeline. Uh, and we need to make sure that with the funds we have available, we are um, we're tackling those school projects first. 
Related to that timeline and pretty critical to maintaining that timeline are a series of um, actions that will be occurring between now and January. Um, and you see we have laid out here certain items that will either be the responsibility of district staff or will, um, will require board action uh, between, now and, um, between now and the end of November. The item, one of the items, and we're going to talk about it in a few minutes, uh, one of the items that's, uh, that will be important to uh, get a decision from the board on, uh, if not tonight, then, then by the end of September, is that property purchase. And the reason being, uh, it has to do with maintaining um, the, uh, the, the timeline that we're looking at here. Uh, in order for us to uh, submit the special use permit to the city, we have to um, have a final plan for what we're going to site on a particular piece of property. And once the special use permit application goes to the city, it takes a couple months to go through that internal process there. So um, if, we, if we wait too long in making a decision um, about the property, that backs up the special use permit process and potentially delays the, um, delays the project timeline. So it all connects together, and we just wanted you to be aware of that um, as as we do talk about the uh, discussion around the property purchase tonight. Yeah. Are we are we saying that the property that we discussed tonight would be more desirable for elementary school number 17 than any other property that we currently own? The, the plan right now, uh, Mr. Lehrman, is to site Elementary 17 uh, on the property that is on the, on the 40 or potentially 60 acre parcel that is on Burns Road. It's the most suitable site uh, that we have for it. And if we had 60 acres, we would possibly site a future middle school there? We would be looking at siting both both buildings there. We're reserving the 76 acres further to the west of Burns Road uh, for the future high school, as was the direction um, when we purchased that property. I like that plan. Well, and and you'll see in we we can we're getting into the we're getting into the discussion now. Um, but so so what we're talking about is 20 acres that is adjacent to a parcel that's about 40 acres that the district already owns. Um, it's at Burns Road, just north of Burns Road. It is within the uh, urban growth boundary. It's between uh, about between Road 90 and 92. The parcel that the district owns is highlighted on the slide um, in the hollow yellow line. Um, the word parcel is squarely within the parcel that we own. And then what we're um, asking for board action on this evening is the, um, the solid yellow parcel to the east. This is an example of what a site plan would look like on a 40 acre site. Uh, it would have an Ochoa sized middle school and this is not what the final site design would look like. This is just to give you an idea of, of what the dimensions would be uh, with comparably sized buildings. But um, so for comparison purposes, you're looking at uh, the outline of a building that is the size of Ochoa Middle School on the left uh, or to the west. And then on the right-hand side or to the east, you have a building that is the, uh, the size of Franklin. Curie. 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 Thank you. So that's the site plan on 40 acres, and then this is what the site plan would look like on 60 acres. Um, the buildings would be uh, further apart from each other, and they would have common, uh, common fields in between. I also wanted to provide you um, some additional information. We, after the draft was circulated to the board on Friday, we got some feedback about uh, different types of information you'd like to have for this discussion. So this slide gives you uh, the approximate school site sizes um, of our current buildings within the district.
And then this is a list of our current property inventory. There's a map that follows this. It might make it a little bit easier for you to see. We currently own um, the 76 acres uh, to the west of the parcel that we've just been talking about and of course the 40 acres that we have been talking about. Uh, we are about to close on the sale of the 20 acres ne next to Franklin, uh, which was previously authorized by the board, so that will be coming off of our inventory. Uh, we do own uh, about 25 acres on Road 84, and this is the planned site for elementary number 16. Uh, we also own almost 10 acres on the east side, uh, just to the west of Ochoa Middle School. Um, that, was, that purchase was completed a couple years ago. Um, we have a very small parcel that was gifted to us, um, and then of course the Road 48 and 52 property, which has also been authorized for sale because it's really not a suitable site um, after we've done a lot of uh, research and, and trying to fit something on there. Um, we are actively looking for property in that same area, however, because we do um, believe, and I think the board has asked us to look for property in that area, knowing that um, down the road as those, um, as, as the the uh, city expands into some of the county pockets in that area that we, um, that's filling in and we're going to need a school there as well. That gives you a bit of a visual. Um, the road, uh, the or the 76 acres, the high school site is to the um, to the far left, uh, to the west. And then I've highlighted in green the two parcels that we that have been authorized uh, for sale, and the other parcels that we own. Where's that teeny tiny parcel that we own? It. I, I, I couldn't make it small enough to fit on the map, Randy. Do you want to? Yeah. It's it's near the. Can put the cursor. Uh, it's near the nine acres that we have on this. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Is it across the road or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. That's what I remember. It's adjacent to the other nine point three. Okay. It could be used across the street. Right. Okay. That's a great map. So. Google. <laughs> so the staff recommendation at this point um, is we would be recommending a purchase of the 20 acres. Um, the site, the, the pros that we see to that is that the site is in a high growth area of the district. Um, it would also offer greater program flexibility, we believe, having a larger site rather than a smaller site. Um, it would allow us if we wanted to, um, for example, locate a smaller program and if we needed to site a facility for that, we, we could potentially do that if we owned a larger, uh, if we owned a larger site. Uh, we also would have improved accessibility for parents and buses and how we can can configure that on the site and it would allow us um, more space for additional facilities growth there. Um, we also have favorable pricing per acre um, right now if we were to uh, purchase that we would be um, potentially under the contract that we're on we would be paying less per acre um, for that site than uh, what we are selling the uh, Frank 20 acres for, for example, so um, so the pricing there is favorable. Some cons that we see to purchasing that uh, property, we of course would have to expend those funds and um, we would not have those funds available to uh, purchase um, other property in other locations. Um, we now have some greater flexibility um, based on the uh, based on the action of the legislature last year. We've got some greater flexibility to search uh, for sites um, outside of the UGA, which we really had not been able to look at before. And so as the district grows to the north, um, we'll be looking there as well. Um, and so we may have some opportunities to look for property there. And just to give you an idea um, of what we have currently in our capital projects fund balance, um, 
the the overall fund balance right now stands at approximately 13.2 million. Um, Many of the funds, though, within that balance are restricted. Uh, so the 2013 uh, authorized bond projects can only be utilized for those 2013 uh, bond projects. Uh, so those would not, and we've expended what we would within that budget to, to purchase property from that bond. Um, we have our impact fee proceeds, uh, which can be used for uh, for certain uh, certain expenditures related to growth, so those could be used for uh, property purchase. Um, we also have funds that the uh, board assigned for the Early Learning Center, which are reserved for for that project, um, and then funds we have set aside uh, for movement of portables. As far as funds that would be available for a property purchase, uh, we'd be looking primarily at impact fees uh, and then property sale proceeds uh, from the uh, transactions that uh, we're working on right now. Were there any questions or any discussion the board wants to have about that? My, my intent would be then to shift into uh, information for you about the, uh, the public information that we're providing for the bond, so this would probably be a good opportunity to pause and talk about the, uh, the property purchase recommendation. Questions or comments from the board? I had a question if you go back to the um, programmatic part of it you said that if we had more space programmatic what do we believe that having a middle school and an elementary school on the same site um, allows greater programmatic flexibility than if we had a 40 a middle school on a 40 acres or if we sold off a little bit of it still 35 30 and we found another site away from there and had an elementary school on 20 acres, mm -hmm. those two sites still would be quite a bit bigger than a lot of our other middle schools and elementary schools. Why couldn't we still have the same programmatic flexibility to put a small building or a small um, program there? Why, why is it better to have it all together? So I'm going to go back to to the site maps. I think to speak to that, um, it it really is a question of site logistics, Scott, and it depends on what you would want to place um, place on that site. So programmatically, you could be looking at um, just the the logistics of scheduling fields and practice times and different activities between the two two buildings um, if you don't have anything there other than the middle school and the elementary school. Um, so there, there's simply more room to breathe if those two facilities are on a larger site. You know, can we make this work? Yes. Um, logistically, would it be um, easier, more beneficial for them to uh, to be able to make it work on a larger site probably and that's part of that recommendation with some additional space in this configuration we could also um, site a um, another program um, like i know the board has talked about parent partnership so, so here's the 60 acre plan right here and i can see some empty space up in the north east corner in several other spots where you could put the program that you're talking about. Now if I had only a middle school on the 40 acres, which is your previous drawing, and then I had only an elementary school on another drawing, those lots are much bigger than say, let's go up and, uh, have, let me look at an example of current schools. Um, if I look at our current schools, I have some, like Curie's on nine acres. Um, that, that's just an example. We go build the same school, we go build with Kiri on 20 acres somewhere else. I have 10 additional acres there. I still have a lot of programmatic flexibility at that site. So why is there more programmatic flexibility to put two schools on one site than if I put an elementary school on 20 acres somewhere else and a middle school on 40 acres here? 
And I think what, what we're intending to say with the recommendation of the pros and cons is that we are going to be citing two schools on that site. So to be able to cite, to have more space to cite them is going to be more flexible. Would, so, so to get to your, your question, would there be even more flexibility to have a standalone 40 acre site and a standalone 20 acre site and have the schools be separate in that way? Sure. So do we have a year or more than a year to look for another site for elementary 17 because it's out starting construction a year past elementary school 16. You do all your paperwork now. Is there a reason why we don't have another year to go find another site that's not right on top of another middle school? Because you didn't put the con up here, but I've heard people say before, we don't like having schools real close together. I know that other districts do this. I know that other districts have middle schools, high schools, and elementary schools all on the same site. But I've heard over the past couple years, I don't want sixth graders near my elementary schoolers. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, it's OK to have seventh and eighth graders near my elementary schools. I personally don't think it's an issue. But I know I've heard some parents saying that. So for some people, that is a con mm -hmm. to have two schools on sure. top of each other and to same have side. the morning congestion and stuff like that. So I, I just. Do we have another year if we wanted to go get another site without impacting <laughs> schedule to go find another 20 acres somewhere for that elementary school? And I would probably direct or that ten question acres. To, to Mr. Nunnemaker. Yeah, I think if you look at the timeline, and Mr. Marsh will correct me if I have the timeline wrong, the, uh, the design needs to start in January to be able to maintain the construction timeline to have the building open um, on the schedule. If we back it up a year, then everything backs up a year because then we won't have the site to design to. So we have to wait for that year until we find the site, and we have to design to that site wherever wherever that would be. And of course, then that would be also locating the site that would be acceptable. It just seems like a lot of time to design when most of our sites are squares or rectangles. Can you go back to the map that the not not to be flipping, but can we expound on that a little bit? Every, Most site, every site is different because you have to take a look at your elevations. You need to look at a host of other uh, regulations. Uh, you need to find irrigation water. You need to meet all those contingencies in order to site a school. And, and that does take a considerable amount of time to uh, satisfy those sites. You can't have a good site. So if we don't buy this piece of property, that elementary school 17 on any other piece of property will probably move out a year. Is that what I'm hearing? That's where it's out. Yeah. All depends, you know, uh, how quickly you can find another piece of property. Yeah, it's a, it's a question mark here at best. And then everything lines up then with depending on when we find the property and when we can get it designed. And how does that line up with uh, OSBI's funding? Because, of course, they fund in July for the state match when we put it in. So there's a, a myriad of, of issues that we would have to address to be able to say when we could open that school up with a piece of property. Um, I absolutely love having both on the same site. I've lived lots of different places. Um, school districts do this all over the country. There's a reason they do it all over the country. There are a lot of benefits to having two school sites right next to each other. You can share facilities. You can um, you can share fields. Um, you know, I my daughter wasn't able to practice volleyball for this whole entire time because the football players were in in their gym. We we are encouraging these kids to have after school activities. It might be a real benefit since a lot of times elementary school gyms aren't used after school. To And that might be an option for utilizing that in an after school situation with the middle school. I do not see a problem with these kids mixing. They're two different schools. During the school day, you're just not going to see that. But you're going to have siblings that probably go to the same school. And that, speaking from a mother's point of view, is going to be immensely helpful to families in just saving time and energy and and sometimes siblings walk each other to school there's just so many advantages to having two schools together i don't i don't even see disadvantages then the infrastructure the roads the 
the the parking all of those things can be shared and to me probably be made cheaper by designing two at once because electrical i mean it just all goes hand in hand so i i just don't see any negatives to having two together the the um this junior high and middle school or excuse me Middle school and elementary school start at two different times. Um, there's, you put two elementary schools together, you're gonna have some major traffic problems. A middle school and, a, and an elementary school, you're going to avoid those. For the first time in my life ever, I have all of my kids in high school, middle school, and elementary school within about a two block radius. It doesn't even hardly happen here in Pasco, and because my kids are in some special programs, that's the only reason it's happened in our family. And even, it, it is just so nice. It is so nice only having those little places to go. So I think this is better for our families. I think it's better for our district. I think it's better for our school kids. I, I can see training advantages. I, can, I just can see all kinds of advantages. I absolutely feel like this is the way we should go. One thing that I am interested in, though, is I know Pasco is looking for park place. We do, I, I do believe 60 acres is above and beyond what we need. So have we looked into, um, into the city of Pasco? Because they need field space. You know, my kids are always needing field space when they're playing sports. This would be a real help to our community, just providing more places for our kids to practice soccer and football and, and baseball and these different things that I think are important for kids' growth. But, um, and, and we found that they actually help student achievement when kids are involved in these extracurricular activities. Can we do a partnership with the city of Pasco in, in some of this maybe? And so that they can use it as a park, we can, you know, they can use it as, anyway, do we have that ability and maybe cut some of the costs? We do have a standing agreement with the city of Pasco um, where we have uh, multiple sites around the district where we have that arrangement with the city and we have the ability uh, in that contract to, to add to that. I haven't been at the table with the city recently to know whether um, we've had conversations about that. Um, you know, Randy, you may have, but yes, it's certainly possible. Yeah, we've talked about both sites. We've actually talked about uh, elementary 16 and sites around that and also future sites, which would include the 40 acres or the 60 acres. Would there be any chance that they'd help us in the purchase of this property if right. we can make a park out of part of it? I would say they'd be open to discussion, absolutely, and they've, they've expressed that. I, I like the look of this 60 acres here. It's just, for me, it's kind of an equity thing, and we've had people say that we built Chihuahua too big on too much property. And when I look at other schools, Stevens is 17 acres, and most of our other elementary schools are 10 acres or less. If I sum those together, we'd have a middle school and an elementary school on 30 acres total. If we put it on 40, I believe there should be some efficiencies gained by putting two schools on one site, shared parking, other things. So as a whole, even on 40 acres, a middle school and an elementary school will have much more space in my mind than so many of our current elementary schools and middle schools. So as a district that has difficulties passing bonds, if I'm looking at equity and where to spend money, I, I would have to say that should be more efficient and the kids should have more space per pupil than almost all of our other schools. I just want to say I agree with uh, pretty much everything Ms. Phillips said. Yeah, can you go back to the map where you have the little squares, the orange, green, the one that just shows what we, uh, yes, perfect. So if you look at, and, and so let's see, Maya's not highlighted, right? But this, this, the area where we have this site for the middle and elementary school is really ideal to have that. So if we were going to look at a separate 20 acre site, I mean, up there somewhere would be ideal. And I think to one thing that, that uh, Mr. Lerman said, you know, with the, um, as far as when you said when you say small anything in Pasco that's small it is kind of terrifies me because nothing can be I would love for us to have all small schools right that's just not possible and we would have had to plan for that you know 20 years ago and that I that would be my dream but it's absolutely not feasible in Pasco so um, if we're talking about being smaller overcrowded or being on top of each other if that's a concern then the 60 acre site makes much more sense where there's not so so much on top of each other and the however i agree that that it's probably more than what you need for both so if we have a partnership with the 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 city i would really like to see us pursue that 
I know at McClintock, there's a beautiful park there that's kind of shared that the community just loves. They have these fancy things, and it's kind of a, a city thing. And no one kind of, no one for sure knows, but everyone loves that it's this really cool park right next to the school, and it's kind of shared. And I don't know if that what partnership that falls into, but it worked out really great uh, for everyone that lives right there. I think that would be a wise use of resources. The the equity issue, I, 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 that's a that's a tough one. I, I don't think we can forever just restrict what we do because some of our 30 or 40 or 50 year old sites are a certain way. Um, if we look at Ochoa, can you go back to now the, the acreage one that uh, Mr. Lerner brought up some of those? This, uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. I mean, if we look at Ochoa, that was the most recent, that's the newest middle school. It's in East Pasco, it's 46 acres, 46 acres. So that was built, what year was that built? 2002? 2002, so it's 15 years old. It's so, an outlier also. What's that? It, it's an outlier, I said. Go, go some ahead. some might argue that yeah, it so has excess land there, too. Yeah, I agree. Could have so, sold off some of that. I agree that it's excess, and we could try to look at that. But but to pull out Stevens or one, some of our smallest sites that are 30 years old and say that, you know, well, we don't want to build any bigger than that because then it's going to be inequitable, just kind of doesn't make sense to me because if it's not working there, uh, we don't need to keep perpetuating something, and we haven't done that with our other uh, sites either because we're just so much bigger than we were 30 years ago. So it makes no sense to go back to small sites uh, when we're when we're massively when we've grown so much in the last 15 years. It, it's just to me it doesn't make sense to compare to what was done 30 years ago when we were a third of the size we are today. If you look at the the sites that we've built recently. Uh, like Franklin, it's 20 acres. My kids go to Franklin. It's really not that excessive. There are so many kids. It is chaos there. There's 800 kids there, and, and I certainly don't feel that we have all this extra space there. So with those schools up north all being huge, Maya has 900 kids right now. Um, there's still tons of growth up there. To me, it seems wise to have plenty of space with uh, looking for more of a partnership with ha which has many other benefits, not just saving money, but just creates more of a partnership with our city, which I've wanted to see for many years between the district and the city. And so I'm definitely in favor of the 60 acres. All right, I gotta weigh in. So the question is, can we make 40 acres work for an elementary school and a middle school? Uh, absolutely we can. I mean, if we're going to rebuild Stevens, and I get it, Dr. Richardson, that Stevens is old, but we're going to rebuild Stevens on 17 acres. Curie was built on 10. And we're talking about a Curie-sized school here. We can build a, a, an elementary school on this property. There is no question that we can get an elementary school and a middle school on this property. I think the bigger question is, how did we get here? Why do we have 40 acres? Did we buy 40 acres because we thought we would need a 40 acre site? No, we bought 40 acres because that's what was for sale. Um, do we need to use all of it for a middle school? I don't think so. I mean, I'm pretty sure if we could go back and redo Ochoa, we would do it different. I certainly would. I would not put 45 acres in a middle school. I mean, you look at a map of that thing, five acres are not used, they're in weeds. Um, does it need to be that big? Could we be more efficient? Certainly we could. As far as program goes, I'm pretty sure if I lived in a, just, just comparing numbers here, a 4,000 square, square foot home versus a 6,000 square foot home, I could find things to do with it. So I think uh, certainly we can run more programs and it would be nice to have this big sprawling field with lots of fields and we could certainly put lots of portables there and make it very nice the um, i would be in favor of pursuing a partnership with the city maybe we could sell them 10 acres of this 30 acre parcel or even five and say look put a little park here on this corner we'll use it during the day for our students and we'll build our elementary school and our middle school on the rest of it. I, I don't think, I think part of the challenge is this. We, we are a district that's limited in capital funds. We, we are struggling right now to put, uh, to put students in permanent classrooms. While this would be really nice, I don't think this is the responsible thing to do. I think there's better ways that we can spend this money. Um, Mr. Lerriman has suggested going out and finding other property. When this property becomes available, we have to have money to go and do that. Uh, I just think we've got to get 
we've got to be responsible with the property that we have and to me to do that we would put on 40 acres and I know it's not quite 40 acres and by the time it's all said and done we're going to give some back to the city and roads and access but but uh, I am confident that we can make a nice site there with an elementary school and a middle school which I am in favor of because of the uh, because of the economy that we can get in doing that so I, I am not in favor of spending a million dollars or whatever it's going to cost at least a million dollars to add 20 acres to that and I I'd add to that, this is a question. It's not just a million. To go develop 60 acres versus 40 acres, you have a lot more flat work, a lot of other stuff to do. Do we have a ROM on how many more millions of dollars it would take to develop the 60 acres versus the 40? Not just develop it, but put down grass, additional flat work, everything else. Do we have that ROM? Because you know, if you go and develop a one acre piece of property and put your house on it, or it, it costs a lot more to go put that same house on two acres. Plus not the just the property costs, and then you got maintenance. More, more irrigation, more mowing, more. So that that's capital cost also. So I challenge us to think beyond, oh, this is only an extra million dollars, unless you guys have that number. I guess it's not not small. So, so I think to be fair, we had, and correct me if I'm wrong, we had 40 acres, we had that parcel. We bought that because that was the size of property they were selling. The owner of the 20 acres beside it said, hey, we're selling this, do you want it? And, and I, I commend you and I commend him for coming and saying, look, here's, here's an opportunity. And uh, we, we should look at it, but to me, the, the, it's, while it's a great opportunity, it's like going to the store and buying something that's on sale, so you buy twice as much as you need. And I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of this. I, I, I appreciate the, the effort. You know, I'm, I'm also a parent that has been to Chihuahua for a million things for my kids at various ages, and every inch of that property is used at times with so many different sports groups going on and there are times that we have had to go meet in Kennewick at, as a PASCO team because there isn't anything available for baseball or for whatever else for our kids to meet. I think it's a benefit to the community especially if the city of PASCO will help buy part of these 20 acres and help in the maintenance costs of the additional acreage you know and and you know, with the extra space that we've had at Ochoa, um, and my kids have had games out there as well. I, it's not like just the whole, I feel like the whole community benefits from something like this. I feel like it's forward thinking, and I feel like it also gives us room for growth and room for for um, future things, like, like a partnership. Um, it plans for the future. Land is valuable. Um, if not, let's plan to, I, I just feel like, that ideally a 50 acre site is probably what we need for an elementary school and middle school to really do everything that's, that, that would be beneficial. Let's plan to sell off 10 acres for building and, and maybe even recoup all of our money with that. I think there's a lot of options, but we completely cut our options off if we don't. A million dollars is a small investment in something that could help our district down the road, and I think we really need to be forward thinking. Land goes really fast. It's in the urban growth boundary. There's just so many benefits <coughs> to this property, and I and I feel like it's important to to utilize that and to be and to be forward thinking, and to help out our community. And I feel like it helps all of our community, not just the people who live right there. Just kind of want to summarize because it seems like a lot of us are saying similar things and I think we agree more than we feel maybe it sounds like we're disagreeing but I, I think from what I'm hearing that you know we certainly having 45 or 50 acres would be desirable and so I don't know the what it would look like with the city certainly we're not going to lose money if we buy the land and, and then decide not to if just look at the properties we're selling right now okay the Franklin property we're making money on that I imagine. I, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. Mr. Nunnemaker, could you get a big head nod? Okay, so we're not going to lose money, and we maintain the flexibility. If we wait or don't, then we don't have we have don't have the option at all. Now, if it, in an ideal world, if we could work with the city right now and have it already figured out, which if we can do that, I'm all in favor of that. 
Uh, that's great. But I agree with Ms. Phillips. I mean, it's not going to, we certainly aren't going to lose money and it only allows us to have that flexibility, which we would not have if we don't do it. I also want to comment just on this idea of making things work. I feel like that's what we've done in the district for the last 10 years, right? And so people that don't have children in our schools feel like things are working pretty good. I mean, it just seems like everyone's doing okay, right? And so this idea of making things work, one of the principals said years ago that it's all smoke and mirrors. If you get down into it, it's crazy. It's chaos. It's scary sometimes. There's so many kids everywhere on top of each other. But people that aren't experiencing it right now or that haven't in the last couple of years do not grasp that because they just see a district and a community making things work the best they can. And it's time to change that. I am confident make a nice site there with a nice elementary school and a nice middle school on 40 acres. What, do you have kids yeah. in our schools right now? I don't have kids in our what, schools. When was the last year that you had children in Pasco School District? 2014. Okay, so but, three years but, ago. But McLaughlin has not grown since my kids were in there. The right. site is the same. In fact, the site is a little bigger, I think. Since some of my kids were there, they've added some acres there. Uh, Franklin, or not Franklin, well, even Franklin, but Curie is on 10 acres. Okay. It, it works. I mean, it, it's wonderful. I would love. Why don't we buy buy that? We I mean, can. It, and we I know we will, can. I hope. I, uh, and we I still mean, have it, money in the capital it, budget for other yeah. projects. It's if, not if like this we're spending everything. I, yeah, I if know. this was going to put us in some and, sort and of I agree, bind, but it doesn't. This would be a great investment if we didn't build on it and we sold it later. But I don't think we have that option. Um, I, I, to me, it's just... It's, it's, uh, it's excess. Uh, you talk about, um, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had room, if we could just put extra fields there? You know, if the city wants to come and buy that 20 acres and, we, and they allow us to use part of it or whatever they want to do with it, that would be fine. But I don't think we as a district need to be, especially where we are, our, our our challenge is not in field space. I'm not saying that we don't need field space, but our challenge is in classrooms. And every dollar we spend on fields is a dollar less that we spend in classrooms. So I think we would be better served to take that money that would, we would spend on that property and find another one further to the west, to the north, um, even up where Franklin and McClintock are. That area is growing buy property over there. If we spend this money here and spend this money in construction of extra space, that's less money that we have to put something in a, in a better location. Well, the, one of the advantages of the large size was that we could add extra classrooms to this space. That's one of the points that they made was that if we wanted to add a homeschool partnership or another smaller school or a but I think magnet you school, just said. you can use that space if we want. Those smaller are things schools. that those are things that we can add, you know, additional. Well, no, it's a homeschool partnership is a different model. We're not talking about a smaller elementary school. We're talking about providing the opportunity to have more uh, more resources and space. No, I don't, no one said, I don't think that it needs to be all field. I, I'm all for, like, having more classroom space there where it would be in a different schedule, a different partnership and model than we've ever had. So it's, there's nothing comparable to it uh, where we would have a homeschool partnership uh, that we've never had before. I would say if that were in the planning right now we need, and we, we were going to do that, that would be great. But this is kind of like you buy a 6,000 square foot home, you're not going to go board off 4, 000, or 2,000 square feet and only use four. You're going to expand to fill that site. And if we buy this property, we're not going to say, hmm, we only need this much. We're going we're gonna to design to that whole site. And I just think it's not the right thing to do. So why don't we provide direction as a board then to buy this property, use the, because I really think 40 is tight. We, we've heard again and again the restrictions that Stevens has. There's just not enough space there. They are so cramped to do everything. I, and would I love to be, I would love to make every single school in this district be up to date, perfect, with enough size and everything else. We can't build to 1960 standards because that's what's equi equitable for our kids. We can provide equity in other ways by still serving kids the best way we can with current conditions. We have to work under that mindset. At this, 
At the same time, I think that as a board, we can provide direction. You know, let's do this with a partnership with Pasco. Let's reserve this much land for a future project. Let's let's cut off 10 acres and and sell it for later. I think any of those options is going to leave us in a great financial position with a great value added to our community and at, at a cost that's going to be much less now than it would be later. But I don't think we should mislead that 40 acres is not sufficient and kids are going to be on top of each other if we build a middle school and elementary school. I heard you say that many schools are doing this across the state. I don't think they're doing it because of programmatic efficiencies or anything else. They're doing it because they don't have land. And I would also beg, I would guess, without going and doing the research, we can go do the research that many of these middle school and elementary school combos are built on much less than 40 acres. So if we believe that Stevens is small at 17 acres, but we believe that 30 acres would be fine for a middle school and 10 acres is fine for an elementary school, we believe that. That's what our entire district almost is built on, except for a couple outliers. Then we can't say that the kids are going to be crawling on top of each other on 40 acres because Again, we could go do a study, look at the rest of the state, and find these things. Have, have we done that already? I would be surprised if there's very many of these um, middle school, elementary school combos that are built on more than 40 acres. Curie, Curie has the advantage, too, of being right next to Ochoa, so it has extra land. Can you go back to the 60-acre site? Sure. So I agree that I'm all for planning. And I, I'm happy to have a plan that, okay, let's purchase this with the plan that we are going to take 10 acres and either work out a partnership with PASCO or that we will plan to develop uh, another use of that space so that we're not just buying a huge space without a plan. I'm, I'm all for planning that, and I'm, I would be in favor of that myself. So it's just it's frustrating that in our discussion, so so Mr. Lim, you haven't had any middle schoolers or high schoolers yet in Pasco. Mr. Christensen not. hasn't had a middle schooler in at least seven years, I guess. So, it's frustrating to to hear the the few. I mean, you don't have an experience with that yet, which I'm read, I'll readily admit. I don't have a high schooler yet. I have middle school now, and I've had lots of years of elementary schools in these last few years. So, it's hard to to hear that when you don't really understand what it's going on, what's going on in our district right now. Uh, through experience, and so you really have to talk to people to get that. Like I said, we can make things work. We make amazing, we, the, our staff does an amazing job, but making things work is not sufficient. We want excellence. We want to provide our students with the facilities they need, with the resources they need, and just making things work. If that's our, our vision and our goal, I think we're really selling ourselves short. Do you believe that your, your student has not had enough play field area I at their middle school? Of, You're saying we need more space here if, at, at elementary and middle school, but w but in the same breath, we're saying we want smaller schools. So we're not going to add additional learning facilities here. We're going to have the same number of students, right, <coughs> and the same number of buildings. We're not going to increase the capacity at all. You just want more play field space. No, I didn't say that. I said I'm all in favor of taking 10 acres and either having a partnership or adding more space there, classroom space. To have bigger schools. No, no. If we had more classroom the, the space, space, it's bigger schools. No, it's not. It would actually make our schools smaller. If we make it a homeschool partnership, that would be a small, different model than we've had that would take students away from our schools and make those schools smaller. But we said we, I've heard certain people say we don't want middle schools bigger than 700 students. Okay. But so what, if we add more space and bring in more students, what kind of students are we bringing in without making the schools bigger? Okay, well, I just explained one scenario. But again, this is the... Can you go back to the 40-acre site? Again, can you make this work? Well, sure. The, the, you know, we, we make tons of things work in our district, but are we going to keep making plans for things that are just going to work, or are we going to actually provide adequate facilities and the resources that we need? Okay. The again, I'm all for making. Do you believe a plan. this is not adequate? Yes. I, yes, yeah, I do. It's plenty. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. So there um, we are. All right. yeah. There's a, there's so again, where we're I, different. Yeah, I'm trying. That's why we're trying to come up with a compromise. That okay, I agree we don't need 60, but I think 45 or 50 would be more ideal. So that's what Ms. Phillips and I are trying to do. We're coming up with a compromise where, okay, maybe we don't need 60, but we don't. We would like more than 40 because the district, our experts, you guys like to say we trust our experts and our staff is recommending that that would be tight. Okay, so we're believing them, which you frequently say is important that we trust the experts and believe what they say, and this is their recommendation. 
and we're trying to come up with a compromise where it's we're resolving some of your concerns but also accepting what our experts are saying that we need so experts how is our program different? Please explain that again to us so that we can understand. Maybe I'm a little slow on the uptake, but uh, other than greater flexibility in more fields. That's pri <clears throat> pardon me. That's primarily the difference with regards to program flexibility. If we wanted to add, like Dr. Richardson described, a facility to house a different program, for example, we would have more space on a 60-acre site to do that than we would on a 40-acre site. Um, the scheduling of the facilities is another is another consideration. Um, so, as far as the district's recommendation, the um, in in our view, the pros outweigh the cons to the purchase, um, but we can, as you can see with the site plans on on uh, on the 40 acres as well, that that can also work. Um, so really, the direction that we're looking for from the board this evening, is, well, right now, is whether you feel prepared to make a decision on this uh, during the regular meeting uh, later on tonight. It is on the agenda um, but if you'd like more information or additional time to think about the different options um, then our timeline would allow us to bring it back to you at the last meeting in September as well so so that really is the the question around around this for for right now is do you want to bring this back later in the meeting or do you need more time do you, go ahead miss Lincoln I think part of the of the process and looking at it. I mean, I think that the 60 acres is a good idea because of the cost. I mean, it, it's less to buy, purchase the, purchase the land now than later. Um, and um, I think that, I think we can do more with the 60 acres myself. And I think having other, other options, I think it's a good idea. So, uh, again, I, I would agree. I mean, if I can get a good deal on a 6,000 square foot home, that's, a, that's great, right? But if I only need four, I've got to pay the taxes, I've got to pay the maintenance costs, I've got to pay the heating and cooling of those additional 2,000 square feet. And that's, I mean, I get it. it. It's wonderful if we can do that. Just because it's a good deal doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. You know, Steve, I grew up in a trailer with six siblings. We added on a little tiny place that had an extra bedroom when we added the seventh sibling. And um, was it adequate? It was. Was it comfortable? It wasn't. Um, I personally don't want to raise my seven children in a 1,400 square foot space. Is it adequate? It is. But, but for a minimum cost, I, I think we need to look at things rather than adequate and excessive, adequate, ideal, and excessive. And I think to be a world-class organization and to offer our kids the very the, the best of all worlds, we're not going to make a new school and make it barely adequate. I, um, I absolutely agree. If anybody thinks that 40 acres is just adequate... <laughs> yeah. I just look at... I just look at Stevens at 17 acres, and and it is not adequate. Right. It, I, it, I, they I, are this, just this is worlds search, bigger than 17. And acres. you're absolutely right. And McClintock at 13, which also is just we, we can't even expand on that to the degree that we need to. We are so limited in so many ways. So, so that's the, those are two really tight things. Uh, options, cost, everything. I, you know, I I think that. Those aren't adequate. I think 40 acres. I think it would be nice to have more. And and I think, and nice. and I. No argument there. I'd rather <laughs> I live on a 6,000 nice square foot home than four. But is 60 acres excessive? Let's make this. Let's make this an investment, and we'll probably get back the investment if we choose not to use it all. I just think, I think we're. I'm ready to make a decision to, tonight. I am too. I, I, I am in favor of bringing it forward tonight. We can okay. have further discussion. All right. We'll, we'll move on and have further discussion tonight. And, and we'll keep uh, it you, you have 10 more minutes, I okay. think. Is that right? All right. And I just had a few more things to share with you with regards to Before the Before we leave this, let me say one more thing. Thank you to the staff that uh, did this background work to us, for us. And as Mr. Christensen and several other board members said, anytime you see these opportunities, even if the uh, 
even if the conversation and debate is uncomfortable, it's not that we're challenging the work you guys do, it's that we're trying to decide what's best for, for all students in the public. So thank you to the staff for preparing that and also thank you to the board for the open uh, dialogue here. Just, just trying to bring you options, so very good. Um, just a bit about the uh, public information that we're putting forward uh, for the bond uh, to share with you in the last uh, few minutes here. Um, as you know, we have our general election uh, general election coming up on November 7th. Uh, we met our August 1st filing deadline. We are on the ballot, uh, and we are currently engaging in our uh, district information campaign. Ballots are scheduled to go out from Franklin County in mid-October, uh, so making sure that we are informing the the community in a way that's legally permissible uh, is uh, what our goal is between now and the end of October. Uh, and this is just a uh, snippet from the PDC guidance uh, that I know that you've seen before and we're ensuring that uh, our the, the way that we're sharing information with the public uh, is in compliance with that PDC guidance. Um, Mr. Edinger and his staff um, have done a great job of pulling together a variety of different different avenues for us to share uh, the information. Um, we will have a presence at various district events and school events, activities and meetings uh, between now and the election uh, with information available for uh, parents and patrons who attend those events. Um, we will also be attending uh, service club and community organization meetings where we're invited to share information about uh, about the bond and, and what is on the bond, uh, and of course attending other community events. For example, we were at the we had the traditional Pasco school district booth at Fiery Foods Festival this weekend, and we had an opportunity to share information about the bond and the various bond projects there. Uh, the um, the rescheduled uh, Pasco High School athletic contests, which were supposed to be in Yakima, but due to air quality came down to Edgar Brown, allowed us an opportunity to have a table there as well. Um, so this is a just a sample calendar um, with a district uh, as big as ours. There are ample and multiple opportunities for us to make sure that we're sharing this information uh, with with our patrons uh, and this is just an example of some of the events that that we intend to um, be be attending or have a presence at uh, public affairs has also um, been um, putting together flyers and posters, uh, the annual fall mailing. We are under PDC uh, guidelines allowed to provide one mailing out to the community and that will be going out uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're also initiating a, a website and social media um, sharing uh, information those ways uh, and preparing um, public service announcements. Uh, we were at one of the television stations today uh, sharing information. Uh, Raquel Martinez and myself um, were able to share some information on their community segment um, about the bond. So we're participating in things like that as well. Uh, this is an example of the informational flyer um, that's available in English and Spanish. Um, and you should be seeing that around the schools in the community um, and of course the information available on the website as well. And this is just a screenshot from the website uh, where people can access that information. Um, we should be posting uh, some frequently asked questions because we do get um, those uh, coming in. So it's, it's nice to be able to post what the questions are and, and allow people to see those answers. Um, we'll be posting those shortly as well. Can I answer any questions about that or, or direct questions to Mr. Edinger? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Thank you, Mr. Edinger. All right, thank you for joining us in our study session this afternoon. Uh, join us for our regularly scheduled board meeting at 6.30.